Let's continue with the example with frame with distributed loads applied to it. So this is the problem we're solving with these values for its properties, length, um, cross-section area, and distributed load. And we had two elements and three nodes. This is the total surface matrix we found for the problem uh, or the structure. It's a nine by nine matrix. And this region, which is shown by this rectangle, is due to node two, which is connected to both elements. So those element, those components of the matrix are added from the global surface matrices for element one and element two. This corresponds to the degrees of freedom, which is common between the two surface matrices. And then we moved on to find the effective nodal forces for each of the element in the local coordinate system. Since element one does not have distributed loads applied to it, its equivalent nodal forces will be a six by one vector of zeros. As a result, the effective nodal force will simply be equal to the local nodal forces that we're looking for. But for element two, we had the equivalent nodal forces because of the distributed loads applied to it. And we also have the local nodal forces. So we're gonna to have to add this six by one vector to this six by one vector to form the total effective or local effective nodal forces for element two. In order to do that, we need to use the transformation matrix for each element. So element one is at 45 degrees which we're going to have to use to make the um, uh, total, the transformation matrix. And element two is at zero degrees, which again, we'll have to use it for cosines and sines in this transformation matrix. And then using that, we can convert the local uh, effective nodal forces to global effective nodal forces. And then we can also convert the nodal displacements and nodal forces using these equations into um, the global forces also, this is the relationship that we're going to use to solve for the unknowns of this problem. So for the effective nodal force of element one, it's very simple. It's basically that equation. It's, it's exactly the same as um, the local nodal forces. So the global effective nodal force for element one would be equal to T, transformation matrix for element one times the effective nodal force vector for element one in the local coordinate system, that, which would give us the local uh, glo global forces for element one. So this is element one, and these are the global forces. In the second node or element, we have the equivalent nodal forces, which we can, we're looking for the global form of it, and the global form of the local nodal forces. However, there's a trick in here. We already know the local forces, and we already know the transformation matrix for the second element. And because it's at 90 degrees or zero degrees, it's easy to find. So we know all of these values. What we don't know, or some of the elements of the vector we don't know are in here. So if I use the transverse of the transformation matrix for the second element, so this is our second element, multiplied by the total by the local if equivalent nodal forces i can find this vector this is a six by one and or six by six and this is a six by one multiplying these two will give me a six by one vector and i have a six by one vector of local global nodal forces for element two some of which I know, some of which I don't know, depending on the boundary conditions of my problem. So having that in mind, I can move on to superimpose the effective nodal forces that I've found so far to make the total effective nodal forces. So for the first element, I have this. And again, this portion is for node two, which is common between the two elements. And I have these two terms for the effective nodal force of element two. Again, the top three are for node two in element two, which have to add with the top three of the local nodal forces, which is again for element node two of element two. 
So what I have to do is to basically add these three portions when I'm creating the total effective nodal forces, which is in here. So F1x, F01, F1y, and M1z are written basically as they were over there. Now I have added these three in here from adding F2x and F2x from the nodal forces or the elements to make them a one value. And then also have F2y from node element one, F2y from element two, which I've shown in here, and M2z from the two elements, which is shown in here. And the equivalent nodal forces, when multiplied by the transverse of the transformation matrix, are having their effects here, 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 and then in these other rows of the vector. So sine of zero is zero, so this one was gonna, is gonna be zero. So it's a, this one. And as a result, I will end up with this six by one total effective nodal forces. Now, because I know the value of Q and L2 and the cos of theta, I can actually put the values in here. And again, this is negative and this is positive, and the two forces are negative. Having found the total effective nodal forces, I can actually apply the boundary conditions. I know that node 2 is free in space, so its boundary conditions or its displacements are unknown to me, but node 1 and node 3 are fixed in space, so they can't move anywhere. That's why I put zeros here, 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 and here. Node 1 is going to have reaction forces, F1x, F1y, and N1z, shown there. Node 2 doesn't have any external forces except for the equivalent nodal forces due to, the, due to the distributed load, so I've put those values in here. The red F3x, F3y, and M3z are the reaction forces at node 3, and the green values are the equivalent nodal forces at node 3 due to the distributed load. So I have again nine equations and nine unknowns, which I can solve to find the displacements here. Again, nodes one and three are fixed, so they're not moving anywhere. So that's why I have three zeros here and three zeros there. And these are the displacements of nodes two in X, Y direction, and then rotation of node two in about the Z axis. Using those values, I can find F1X, F1Y, and M1Z, the reaction forces at node one. And then I can find the reaction forces at node three as well. Then I can move on and use these values to find the nodal forces per element in the global coordinate systems. So each element has its own global coordinate system or uh, has its own forces, nodal forces in the global coordinate system, which I've shown in there. As you can see, F1x here and F2x are equal but opposite in direction, or so that means they give zero. So is the F1y and F2y. However, there is some moment in this element, and that is because we have distributed load in this um, problem. And same is true for the second element, but you here we also have some Fy applied to the um, uh, element, and that's again due to the distributed load which is present in this frame structure. So in this example, we covered a frame which has its uh, which has distributed load applied to one of its beams.